listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps creatives in film get where they're going faster by sharing the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives across the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Klein. Um, I'm a director and I am the co-founder of Red Glass Pictures. Um, You may know me for a piece I did with Neil deGrasse Tyson, which has 75 million views. Um, And I am currently working on a film with MIT on really, really cool young innovators. Sarah Klein, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thank you, glad to be here. We are so glad to have you. You are ultra accomplished in a variety of ways. You're not just a director, but you've produced. You're an abstract artist. You're a mother. You do it all. I want to read from your bio to give this audience a deeper sense of who you are. And as I always say, this is the internet. So if anything's wrong, feel free to amend to the bio and say, hey, This has changed or whatever. Red Glass co-founder Sarah Klein is an award-winning producer and director. Her early credits include the HBO documentary Hard as Nails and the art film The Good Mother. Red Glass Pictures was formed in 2006, and since then, Klein has co-directed and produced many notable projects, including History of Memory for HP and a series of short films for Ken Burns uh, or Ken Burns' Cancer, The Emperor of Maladies which won a DuPont Award. Among the many hats she wears at Red Glass, Klein leads creative development and production. She has had the honor of interviewing the Obamas, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, John Kerry, and Warren Buffett, and the great director, J.J. Abrams, just to name a few. How was that, Sarah? Did that, did that okay. sound accurate? Yeah, that, you know, it, it was perfect. I want to start with something interesting I found out about you and the research Uh just living in the world of Sarah Klein for the last week and a half or two, which was a fun world to live in, I have to admit. It's been really great. One of my most fun research sessions in recent memory. Uh, You fell in love with film after watching Hoop Dreams. And I, I want to touch on that because... I think it's one of the most beloved documentaries in the black community. Hmm. And I don't know if you knew that you probably did know that, but what about it inspired you? How, why why hoop dreams? I just wanted, I got to know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's beloved in in all communities. um, But of course it makes perfect sense that it, it hits a special place in the black community. Um, I watched it on the big screen when I was in college Um, I, my family's from Chicago. Um, I, I didn't grow up there, but I had a real soft spot for Chicago. Um, you know, I, I go and see this documentary, um, and it just, you know, this is, you know, I said, this is the nineties. We didn't have tools at our disposal. You know, Steve James and Kartemquin went out, um, and did something that, you know, I had never seen before, which was embed and be part of people's lives for years um, and, and tell us a story that wasn't just a, a news flash, that wasn't just, um, you know, here's this family struggling. I mean, this was a story of hopes and dreams and um, heart. And, it, you know, basically from that moment on, I was like, you know, I want to do this. I, I, I want to tell people stories. Um, you know, I want to show people a world that is sometimes one they they've never been to and sometimes one that they know well, but, but they see it differently through the film. Um, and yeah, and I ended up actually moving to Chicago, um, after college. So, you know, and, and the, um, you know, from there, I, you know, I know the Kartemquin folks, I was able to kind of do a little more work in that, in that world. So it, it, you know, it really impacted me. You play basketball, right? Yeah, a little bit more so in the past. <laughs> how how would you describe your game? Like, are you are you a scorer? Oh, or are yeah. you a shooter? Uh, scrappy, just scrappy. High like, motor. It's ugly. It's so ugly. 
it's a lot of defense and it's, um, you know, team play. So I, I grew up playing soccer. Mm -hmm. So in this weird way, I have this, um, you know, I pass probably too much. Like I'm the person that, you know, if there's a, if there's a tall person on the team, I will always be the one to get them the ball, but I'm not necessarily the one that's going to like, um, you know, go in and try to, you know, dunk the ball. <laughs> you're, you're a facilitator, me. Sarah. What'd you say? You're a facilitator. That's, that's exactly right. That's a good you, way to you, put it. You, you do in basketball what you do in film. Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. And, and I'm also scrappy. I mean, I'm, you know, that's, that's a good, that should be my, you know, in my bio, basically. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll put it in the obit. In, in 90 <laughs> years um, because yeah, I think that applies to your, the way you do film as well. Scrappy, you're going to get it done. I love that. <laughs> Speaking of it. scrappy and get it done. I want to make sure I have my facts right on this. Yeah. Your mom is Kathy, right? Yeah. Yeah. She's a notable artist in her own right. And yeah. an accomplished yeah. jewelry designer uh, growing up with her. I want to go back to your childhood a little bit. Well, what influence would you say her creativity had on your artistic talents and creative expressions? Wow. Yeah. I, this is, this is, thanks for going this deep. Um, you know, yeah. she, I used to watch her, um, you know, she works on a, on a bench, you know, with silver and gold. Um, she does all her pounding on a tree stump um, to, so it absorbs the shock. Um, wow. It's physical. It takes strength. It takes, um, you know, incredible creativity. And, you know, I think, I don't know, honestly, I think the sheer act of watching your parent create, like has a major impact on a child. It, it shows you that, you know, you can make something from nothing with your own hands, um, that the thing you make is of value, that it's worth something. Um, and, and that, you know, for her, it happened to be gold and silver, but really that was beside the point. It was the fact that she, made something she believed in and then it existed. Um, you know, and for me as a, as a kid and also as a young adult watching her, um, it just, it made it seem like a right that we as humans all have, right. That we should all have the confidence and, um, and, you know, we, and perseverance to take something and make something from nothing. Um, and so she, you know, she really, she still makes it. She's, you know, 73. She is, I mean, literally her shoulders are so strong. Her hands are so strong. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing to watch. Yeah. It's Kathy Caldwell, by the way, for those who want to find the jewelry. I love that saying, I love that quote you just had. We all have the right to create. And one of my biggest regrets, you're talking about watching your parents create. I have three kids of my own and um, a couple of them are grown now. So <clears throat> it's not, a, it's not a, a regret that keeps me up at night, Sarah. I don't want to over dramatize it. <laughs> okay. It's this okay. minor regret of sort of trading uh, a big chunk of my creative adulthood to go after money <laughs> and, and sort of security like, you know, secure the bag, as the kids say. And, and then now I find myself uh, sort of in the middle of, of my life coming back to the creative, you know, since 2015 and just doing this full time. And it's been so rewarding for my youngest that's still in the house with me. Yeah. To your point, like to watch me every day creating something. Mm -hmm. And if I, somewhere... Somewhere I knew all along the power of that, of witnessing that, that example. But um, it, sits, it, it, it sits behind a veil <clears throat> if you allow it to. And you say, well, what about the example of waking up every day at 7 a.m. and going somewhere and showing you have that grit and discipline too? So again, it's not a dramatic regret, but it's just interesting that you say that because I think it's so, so, so true. Yeah. And I mean, just to go on that, you know, you, you almost, you don't have to say much to your kids. You don't have to um, like preach. You just, it's like, they just see it, you know? And so it's, it's literally just standing in the same space with them creating, um, even if they're not even, if they're doing their own thing that I, I think does make, you know, a huge imprint. Um, and it did on me too. Yeah. Amen. 
Uh, you co-founded Red Glass Pictures, your film production company, in 2006 with uh, Tom Mason. Yep. Uh, and we're still we're still doing it. Still doing it. <laughs> Great cinematographer. Yeah. Uh, how did the two of you meet? Um, so I was working on a, a feature film called Hard as Nails with HBO with a director named David Holbrook. Um, and Tom came in to be, um, at that point, you know, he's a little younger not a lot at that point it felt like more but um you know as he at that point was was an editor and a um kind of also helped produce a little but he came in to kind of help facilitate the film and once that film finished um you know we started to kind of find some projects to work on together um and you know it took a couple years before we could say like hey we're all in let's just let's let's make this happen let's let's not try to take other work let's commit to like building this this um production company so yeah i mean it it all started with that film though what was it about his process or what was it about your workflow that he saw and said hey i can do that i can work with this person or you saw in his workflow or or the way he did things where he said okay i can start a business with this guy Yeah. I mean, you know, you have to ask him about working with me because, you know, who knows what he would say, but um, (laughs) from my, from my point of view, um, you know, it's sort of like, I don't know, it's like dating. And, and just to be clear, we are not, you know, we are not in a relationship aside from work. Um, But it's like dating, you know, that our personalities really worked well together. He's a real problem solver, super creative and super smart. And I felt like, um, you know, we were able to like work through stuff together, solve problems together, and also um, creatively get on the same page pretty quickly. Um, We've grown together. We now speak almost exactly the same creative language. So when we watch a film together, like I know what he's thinking. He knows what I'm thinking. I mean, obviously we're, you know, we have some of our own thoughts, but it it really is a meld. Um, And, you know, that just develops over time. But it, it was, it was like, we just had a, compat- a compatibility early on. And, he, you know, this was, I think, 15 or 16 years ago now. So, yeah, it's a long relationship. <laughs> it's a long one. Right. It, it's, it's a small miracle. It is. It's a, to- it's a big miracle. It's, it's really, really unusual. Yeah, it's think unusual. Right. It, you're, you're right. It really is a big miracle. I, <laughs> I have a, you know, you know, Nick, you, you met him first, but yep. he, uh, you know, we've been in each other's lives for about 21 years now and we've never had a fight. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? So it just, it's one of these things where it's like, and to be clear, we're not in a relationship either, but, (laughs) but this working relationship and this friendship works really well. And it just happened immediately. It was just boom. And, and so I'm listening to your answer and thinking, Oh, I know what that feels like. She's She's going to, you and Tom are going to do great things for the rest of your lives because it's, once you have that part done, it's easy it's, or much easier because you don't have to deal with any of the petty, you know, shit that happens, you know, in between. Yeah. So go ahead if you had some. Well, no, I mean, I guess, you know, just to say like we, we, we have similar values and goals when it comes to our work. We also, you know, have been very, um, very clear with each other on work-life balance. So even though, you know, we work really hard, we're, um, you know, we're really passionate about what we do. You know, we've always taken about a month off in the summer um, to do the kinds of things we need to do to re, um, to re, you know, boost or what's the word, Um, you know, to, to get ourselves back together for the year. You know, as we've gotten older, sometimes we have to take those at separate times so we can be managing things going on at, you know, at the office, but, you know, we both really, really believe in, um, you know, our own time, our creative outlets, you know, it's something that we've kept as a really strong value with the company. Yeah. It's, it's a brilliant thing to do. I think Tim Ferriss talks about that a lot. Like it's beginning of the year blocking three weeks of just, you're just off. And for him, he like goes off the radar. Like he doesn't even have internet. Um, I also find is your partner someone that can criticize you without you being defensive? And can you criticize him or her without being defensive and meaning true defensiveness, not, not artistic, the artistic pushback that you would give as an artist and say, well, this is what I was thinking, but like, 
you know, are you truly offended? And if not, that's a great sign that you're going to work well together. If you can criticize each other's work constructively. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's weird. The word criticism implies this thing that, you know, I don't even know if that falls over the realm we're in, (laughs) but we're in a constant creative loop and process constantly talking about what works and what doesn't, Um, you know, the, the parts of edits, the parts of shooting, what happened in our shoot day, what part of the interview didn't work. So it, it's gotten to the point where it's, it's not even like, oh, he criticized me. It's like, okay, that input I'm going to take, I'm going to take to the next thing. He's taking the input I gave. Sometimes we don't take each other's input. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway. But, um, but you know, it all is this very organic beast. So to call it criticism, um, it almost feels like that word it like lives in a different realm uh, because yeah. our goals are the same. Right. So it's like, you know, and we know that about each other. So it's just trying to like get through, but yes, yeah, sometimes egos can be a little bruised, I guess. Well, you talked about hard as nails and you also did American justice. Oh yeah. Way long. Uh, and we'll talk about hard as nails a little bit later. Um, in this conversation, but you guys mostly specialize in short format docs. Uh, Why is that? Yeah. So years ago, um, you know, we did, we worked with this company called local projects and we did a series uh, for the Olympics, 2008 Beijing Olympics, where it was all, you know, in, in the situation, in the space, a bunch of short films, Um, And we liked the way that felt Um, after coming out of doing some longer features. We just liked the way it felt. And we worked together on these. And then we ended up doing another short that got, that was on the New York times. It's called miracle on 22nd street ended up getting optioned for, you know, by Tina Fey and universal has not become a film yet, but it got a lot of attention. And we sort of saw this and this was 2010. We saw it as like, Hey, there's potential here you know, at that point, short films were considered really like the stepchildren of feature documentaries. Um, And what we saw was like, there was a world opening up for these short films. And what we liked about them at that point, and you know, we've evolved a little bit since, but at that point, we felt like our short films could really get seen, that we were getting the kinds of feedback and, um, you know, interactivity around them that are sometimes harder to get with features and festivals. Um, and so we, you know, we started to kind of build, build our company around that. And, you know, some people thought we were nuts because again, like there wasn't a lot of money in in short content then. (laughs) Um, and so, you know, what's happened, (laughs) but what's happened, you gotta know your, you gotta know your distribution more specifically. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's happened over the years is that like, you know, people need and want videos for a thousand reasons. And that was just starting to happen, um, you know, in 2008, nine and 10, like the, you know, people, it, it was just starting to happen. So, um, so we kind of capitalize on a lot of those needs while making our shorts. Um, right. Yeah. You guys don't just make, and when this audience watches your films, which I hope they do, they'll, they'll see what I mean. You, you guys make a lush documentaries i mean these are these are top notch the storytelling is great it's not like just pushing stuff out to push it out so we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit but you guys focus on story audience and platform those are the elements of how you create your short form docs can you expound on those elements and 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 how they interconnect for this audience and and maybe for the filmmakers listening, why they should focus on those three things? I mean, honestly, we came to those after just a lot, a lot of trial and error with um, projects. So I think we all know the feeling of creating an amazing thing, whether it's anything, but in my, let's talk about a film and then having no one see it. Okay? Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. one thing that it, it can kill your soul a little bit, um, yeah. you know, and so what we think about a lot, especially when we get asked to make projects, let's say it's PBS or, you know, a brand or um, an institution, you know, the, the first thing we talk to them about, of course, is story. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But we also want to know, you know, who is this for? You know, you know, who are we making this for? Now, obviously with PBS, we kind of know. Um, but with a place like, um, you know, let's say MIT or any thousands of other places, you know, who is this for? That's super important to know as a filmmaker with, with a client. Um, and as a filmmaker, when we're thinking about our short films, um, who's going to want to watch this? Um, you know, what, like, who are we making this for? We love this idea, but is it going to, like, how is it going to land? I mean, those are important things to think about. Um, the other thing is, is platform, it's distribution. I mean, if two things, if you're not thinking about that, when you start making your own film, you know, it's going to be a pretty rude awakening. Um, when you, when you finish that beautiful, perfect film and you have no clue where to put it. Um, (laughs) so it's really, really important to think about that and to make those connections, whether it's the New York times, whether it's um, an editorial outlet, you know, a, a streaming outlet. Um, and you know, when, when a client comes to you, that that it's just so important that you find out what their plan is for the project because they can get really disappointed. Um, they can put way um, a lot of money into your side of it and not enough into the distribution and PR, and it ends up hurting the whole project. So, I mean, these are the things that should be thought about and talked about really early in both a personal passion project and the client based project. Um, yeah. And we have partners, like if, if we have a client who hasn't really thought that much about this, we have partners that we work with who we can, you know, bring on to, to manage that um, on all ends. Because, you know, for us, it's, it's so important that we make something that gets seen, <laughs> um, you know, because we feel pretty confident that we're going to make something that is, is going to be, you know, good. And we don't want it to just sit on someone's website with, you know, a hundred views. Yeah. That's the, worst. In the past. that's that's the worst. And I do think filmmakers know this, but at the very least, they know it in some abstract way that in pre-pro they're supposed to, supposed to be thinking about where the film's going to go and, and making plans. But yet in indie film in this world, I see it over and over and over again they didn't, the business structure of, of the whole film is wrong and they're going to figure out distribution if they can get through principal photography. And it's like, ah, you did it. You, right. you, yeah. you got to, you got to do it backwards. You got to think about the end first in the beginning yeah. and then it will turn out, you know, a little bit better. Uh, we did yeah. mention your work with Ken Burns yeah. earlier in the top of this conversation was there something that Ken Burns or, you know, or that Ken demands or wants in his films that we might not know about? I mean, let me just say that, like, we've actually kind of worked with Ken in a very unique way. Um, and that, you know, we haven't, only once have we really kind of fit into one of his longer films. But, you know, we've made, like, kind of addendum films to his, or we've made a film about him. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely some things about Ken that, you know, are interesting. One is that um, he speaks in fully formed, perfect paragraphs <laughs> that have the, like, when you look at them transcribed, it could, re- it could be immediately printed. You know, unlike me or most of us where I have a thousand likes and ums and my words don't always fit together correctly, you know, he speaks in these perfect paragraphs. Um, he's also an incredibly loyal human. It one, you know, when he decides that you're his people in, in whatever way that is, um, it is a friendship for life. I mean, I, you know, Ken and I have, you know, we're bonded. We've, you know, we text each other, we go out to um birthday meals, I mean, you know, and all of that came from, you know, interviewing him. 11 years ago, 12 years ago, and him deciding that like, Hey, these, these are my people. I want to like get to know them, you know? Um, so I would say that's something he's incredibly loyal. He also goes through so many rough cut screenings. So he'll invite, you know, you'll get invited to these screenings and he's shown them to like multiple, multiple audiences as they go. So he really does believe in collaborative input. Um, and he takes everybody's input from the intern to whomever very seriously. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, he's, he's the real deal. Um, he, he really is, a you know, he's a really good human. <laughs> that's um, what we hear. We've had a mm-hmm, few people on mm-hmm. that have worked with Ken and it's this, usually that's the story is that yeah. above all else, you know, he's the nicest man in the world. And you mentioned the rough cut screenings. I think everybody would say, okay, at least director cut screening, like, or like a final cut screening. We got a screening audience tested, but now there are all these people out there that are leveraging uh, big data analytics huh. to do the screenings. We, we got to have one of these guys or gals on that do this stuff. Yeah. So now they, now they go so deep into the psyche of the audience that you can fine tune your movie instead of let's say doing a broad stroke of like, okay, well, let's just switch the whole ending or, um, you know, gosh, we we're going to have to go in and do a bunch more B roll or whatever, or pickups or whatever you can now just tweak one little thing. And, um, in the podcasting world, Sarah, there's this very inexpensive and sort of, I guess now it's becoming ubiquitous software that, let's say you said something that you didn't mean to say, right? Mm -hmm. The software will go in, learn your voice and tone, and then say the word that I type in and it'll come out of your mouth. And this is being used in podcasting now. Of course, the the applications beyond podcasting can be quite sinister, but I do like that the first application is a positive one. It's designed to like correct someone's flub, but you know, it's like you could do that instead of even spending the money on ADR. Maybe I don't even know, but it's a, it's a fun world we're going into and it's right around the corner. Yeah. I mean, fun and scary. <laughs> yeah, Fun and scary. That's the way to, that's exactly the way yeah. to put it. Um, there are a ton of these social media advisors now. Yeah. Like Gary V and like the army of copycats that he has that all go out and expel, uh, Spells on the same thing saying, Hey, push out content, push out content. Doesn't matter what it is. Stop being so self conscious. Just put out the content. And you and Tom went the opposite direction. And I tend to agree. You guys have this thing where I think your quote is saying, Now the media landscape is flooded with so much content that it can almost feel disposable. And I agree with that. Even the word content implies a cheap commodity. That's not what we make. We approach each story asking the same basic questions we always have. How can we take this story, these people, words, ideas, and images, and turn them into something that can last and be beautiful? That really moved me when I read that, because I think that is the approach that the artist wants to take on content. And that's why I think so many filmmakers have a hard time taking the advice of just put anything out there. You know, it feels like shitting the bed. I don't know. What are your, what are your thoughts? Oof. I mean, um, you know, I think we come from like a tradition and it, maybe it ages us, you know, but, um, like we come from sort of the hoop dreams, um, the tradition where you, you make something that's real, that like has lasting impact and that, um, moves us. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's almost like a little bit of our soul dies if we know we're not doing that. And it's not to say that we always get the chance to make the most beautiful thing in the world, but, uh, you know, we're, we're stubborn, um, you know, maybe to a fault. I mean, I think you, someone could easily argue the other direction. Like we, you know, if we had made more of this stuff, you know, we could have this and that, but, um, really for Tom and I, like at the end of the day, we want to believe in what we're doing and this is the way we can continue to believe in it. And we've stuck to it. And it's interesting because we've watched, um, the fads, we've watched the wave of public opinion go back and forth. I mean, now that it's been, um, you know, 17 years, we've seen everyone go, well, quick, fast, cheap. Um, <laughs> no, like long and beautiful and thoughtful. Like we've seen so many tides and, and we just at this point have decided like, we're going to make the thing that we believe in. Um, and, you know, and we hope by doing that people will come, people will watch, people will hire us. And, you know, 
we'll be able to keep doing it. Yeah. I, I had a, two people that mentored me outside of my business mentor when I first got into the corporate world many, many years ago when I was cutting my teeth on contracting and all these different consulting gigs. And one guy was always high anxiety. He made like a thousand calls a day. He cussed out his mom. You know, he was, he's one of these guys he wore. He's one of these kind of cats that would wear his like Mercedes Benz hat into the office. And, um, and then another guy, and I sat between these two guys learning from them. Another guy was slow and methodical. He'd spend an hour and a half on the phone with you, a lot less productivity. They'd both end up in the same place where they were both super successful, but I just liked the lifestyle of the guy who took it slower, better. I didn't yeah. want to be this high anxiety guy, guy who has a broken phone screen all the time because he threw it against the wall, you know, all these different things that happen. And so yeah. it feels like that to me. It's like, yeah, you can just throw all this content against the wall and see what sticks and live this high anxiety, high need for feedback loop lifestyle, or you can do it the Sarah and Tom way and be methodical, make what you want to make, make it great. And then you'll end up in the same place. So it's really just a choice, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you know, we also, we have our moments where, you know, like everybody questions their work and like, you know, Oh, um, should we go long form? Should we do this? I mean, every, maybe every year we have kind of a state of the union and talk about like, what are our goals? Where, um, where, and then every once in a while will be like, we'll get this new flush of ideas and then let's sit with them. Like, Oh, should we expand into this? At the end of the day, um, you know, you almost have to do the thing that you keep coming back to. So, you know, and so maybe for your high anxiety guy, like that was just his place. Like he, that was like the place he kept yeah. coming back to. That's where he lived. But, you know, for Tom and I, it's like, we keep coming back to wanting to, you know, sit down and pour over each film um, and, you know, be involved and care about it. Um, and no matter how much at different times we've like thought, maybe we could do another way. Maybe we could do this. Like it, it's, it's like a gravitational pull that we can't get away from. And so I guess that's just make, that's who we are. I mean, ultimately you just have to look at who you are based on your decisions over time. And like yeah. over time, we keep deciding the same thing. So, you it know, is, it is are. a beautiful moment. <laughs> and I had this epiphany nine years ago, I think. It is a beautiful moment when you can look yourself in the mirror and accept who you are. Flaws and all. You know, if you're, if you're, you know, you need to understand where you came from. I grew up very modestly. I grew up around people who didn't have your best interest at heart all the time. I grew up around, a, a, you know, type of poverty, um, deviance, uh, drug abuse. And some of that is baked into me. And I just have to stop being ashamed of it. Like, let me accept that. Like, okay, there's a part of you that you're not going to be able to escape easily and that yeah. you're always going to remember and know. And then, so you live in that place and that's what you do. So I, mean, I dig that. I, I, I love it. Speaking of people who just are who they are, am I pronouncing his name right? Justin F Fatisa? Oh gosh. Yeah. Fatika. Yeah. Fatika. I watched hand uh, hard as nails. I watched yeah. it. That was, if anything, entertaining. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. to watch, just to watch him behave. And it made me think she's done all these documentaries, Sarah, she being you, sir. You've done all <laughs> these documentaries with all these subjects out of the dark. You've done um, uh, the, the future me. Uh, so you've met these people. I just wonder, do you keep up with your subjects? And, and if so, what is Justin up to today? Well, you know, Justin is actually one that um, I worked with a director on that project and I feel like they, they bonded a bit and they keep up, but you know, Justin is still preaching. He's still, <laughs> and just so people know, I mean, this guy is like an evangelical Catholic preacher um, using really, really unconventional methods to, to bring kids to the fold. Um, mm -hmm. And he's the kind of guy that like, it's easy quickly to kind of dismiss or think, Oh, it's too much. But then, then you see some of the work he's doing and, you know, 
you have to find a soft spot. Um, but you know, he's got like a ton of kids he's preaching. Um, and you know, he's still living, he's still living the life. Um, you know, (laughs) but, 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 but that said, yes, I, I actually like keep up and text with or email with so many of these subjects. I mean, it's kind of an incredible thing to just, um, think about in my life, even, you know, and even some famous, some of the famous ones, you know, when you sit down and connect, it creates, I don't know, it creates like this little magic. And, um, you know, as you're seeing, and as you know, with the work you're doing, it's different than spending five minutes with somebody, you know, if you spend two hours, three hours, four hours, just like holding space, listening and asking questions, there's a bond that happens that is, um, pretty profound and it's unforgettable. So, you know, and it doesn't matter who it is. I mean, it could be, you know, it could be a 17 year old kid in high school. It could be Warren Buffett. Um, (laughs) the, the bond and that intimacy of sharing that space, um, is something that like really, really does tie you to another human. And yes, I mean, um, uh, you know, I find that I have a responsibility to all of these people, um, to the, uh, there's something like, su- there's something really sacred that they've given me by telling me their, their deepest feelings and, yeah. and really sharing their lives with me. And I, I, I do, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like I love them. <laughs> um, you know, I, I feel like it's a kind of love, you know, it's like my heart, like I want to, protect them. I want to see how they're doing. I want to care for them. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. And, you know, and then some of them, you know, I lose track of for whatever reason, but you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm constantly texting with various subjects. (laughs) I love that. I think that's great. Uh, Speaking of famous and people you're keeping up with, you have had the honor of interviewing some very, very famous people, uh, the Obamas, uh, the notorious RBG, uh, the, uh, JJ Abrams. Um, is there anything that you learned? What did you learn as a result of interviewing such notable, notable people that maybe you didn't know before? Is there any well, stories I that stick learned, out? Um, like I learned my capacity to just sweat through my clothes <laughs> is, <laughs> is really, really intense. Um, I, I can tell you that. Um, I, with, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, you know, she's at that point, she, she barely did interviews. I had you know a group of people watching me interview her because like the act of her doing an interview was so profound. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was so nervous. Um, we were able to find, we, we figured out that our families had grown up within two blocks of each other in Brooklyn. Oh, wow. Um, you know, my generation before, uh, so that kind of gave us a little bond and, and, you know, I did it, um, but it, I was nervous. I mean, on those, you know, that level and, you know, with the Obamas, like, come on, I literally, like, I sweat through, like, uh, I could have had like three changes of clothing that day um, because we also had to wait a while for um, first, you know, Michelle came in and then Barack Obama came in and, um, you know, we're... Uh, I'm trying, I was told not to ask for a photograph with them. And I, and I looked at this whole crew and I, you know, I did, I asked, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, what's, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Like I either end up with a photograph to show my grandchildren or I get told that I've done something I wasn't supposed to, but anyway, yeah. I mean, so I would say on a basic level, I, you know, these are things I've learned, but um, I guess what are you asking about sort of, when it comes to sort of the, the actual, you know, interview or something about them that people wouldn't know, like either, or any stories that come out of these interviews, maybe favorite memory of yours, favorite story that they might've oh, told. Gosh. Um, well, a favorite story. This is, this is not something I thought about in a minute. Um, uh, you know, I will say that we, Tom and I laugh about the fact that when we interviewed J.J. Abrams, which was like years and years ago, he had never seen a Canon 5D. Like he had never <laughs> seen a, a camera used as an, as a, like an SLR used for video. And he's like, what is that? Yeah. And it's that's because the, no one was the legendary that. camera as well. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, you know, no one was doing it yet, but we, you know, 
we had heard about it. We did it. And it was like, we were basically teaching him about this new technology, which always gives us a little bit of a laugh. I mean, the other thing is, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson came in very clear that he was just going to do three sound bites for another project we were doing. And he was adamant about it. And I was like, all right, Neil, like we gotcha, you know? And he's like, and also Sarah, I don't have opinions. So don't try to make me <laughs> in this. I'm not giving you opinions. I, you know, I, I stay, I talk in facts, you know, don't try to give me your opinions and then, or make me give opinions. Mind you, this was right after Trump was elected. An hour and a half later, um, we ended up with a long <laughs> interview of, you know, Neil would argue with me on this, but they were opinions, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, um, which we turned into this, this film called On Science, which really struck a chord with people at a specific time. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it, and, and another kind of funny story out of that is that we actually took Neil... Ken Burns lives down the street from where we did the interview. And so I, I texted him and said, like, do you guys want to go to dinner? So we ended up going out to dinner with, like, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Ken Burns, which oh, that's awesome. I feel like is a pretty funny table to walk by. You're like, yeah. what is happening? Um, anyway, not table. to get, like, name. I don't, I, you know, I, it's not the, less about name dropping, but it's more to fun. The, like, it's, it's fun to hear these stories of people that we all, you know, have heard of. <laughs> yeah, we all we we all know and love. And yeah, by, by the way, it's like I, I heard this thing that Bill Maher said about you know the way to fix America right now is just to let Obama have a another term and figure out a way to get him in the office, even if you know it's not legal right now. Uh, but and there's some historical precedent around that with FDR and things like that. But it feels like we were all were jazzed up and juiced up for a female president. Yeah. And then Hillary didn't win. And then you hear nothing about it. Like, is that all we had was Hillary? Wasn't like, is well, there, you know, there, there some there. other woman that's qualified that can step up and get us to this place where we can have a female president? I, I don't understand why it was, it felt like all of our female president, you know, ambition eggs were put in the Hillary basket only. I mean, you know, I have my takes on this. If you really want to go into Please, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love I to mean, hear. I don't know. You know, I think it was. It's very easy for people to like think about uh, nominating a woman and having a female president when her last name is sort of attached to a male predecessor. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it was a harder leap for people to imagine this happening um, with someone that was sort of untested. Um, you know, and. I think that absolutely is going to change. I mean, you know, maybe Kamala Harris is, is a possibility, but I mean, I, I think that Hillary just happened to make sense at that time and then clearly didn't because she didn't win. But um, uh, yeah, it's going to happen. It's just, I don't know. I mean, interestingly, this country feels almost like it's, it's less, it's like less apt to, to nominate a woman than, you know, than anything else. Like it feels like it's a very like tough pill for people to swallow. And I, I really have no idea why. Yeah. And whenever a woman becomes prominent in politics, she's immediately polarizing instead of being centrist. Like, and I don't think they're polarizing. I'm not saying they're polarizing individuals. They could be, but I'm saying the media immediately makes them, okay, if you're AOC, she's, you know, a socialist. If you're Christian cinema, she's a, you know, a Democrat name only. Uh, if you're Sarah Palin, you're uh, a doofus and we can never elect you. So it just feels like, uh, so I'm not being partisan. I'm simply saying every time a woman comes up and wants to be in power and give her opinions, we put her in a box. We say, you're this, you're that. It doesn't matter if you're right, left, liberal, uh, uh, Republican, uh, progressive, libertarian, whatever, if you're a woman, we find a box for you, we put you in it, and then that keeps you from being in the center enough to get a lot of votes. Well, I mean, are you surprised by this? <laughs> because no, basically I'm not. the reality of, um, I mean, this is, this is the female experience. I'm disappointed. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's that classic experience of, you know, and it, I think it also applies to 
in a lot of ways to people of color, but it's like proving yourself more, um, getting criticized more, um, being boxed into a stereotype more and having to then kind of find your way out of that. And, and, um, and the person who does that, you know, is going to be a thousand times more qualified and amazing than the person they're running against because they've had to break through um, all of these stereotypes. But, you know, who is that person? And honestly, who wants that job? I mean, uh, you know, (laughs) it's a good point. (laughs) I mean, it is a special human that wants to go out and and deal with, deal with that. Um, Every person that goes in looks young and comes out looking. Oh yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's a stress. It's a stressful job. I want to take us into a speed round. Oh geez. Speed round questions to wrap us up here. What are the two best pieces of advice? you've received so far in your career and, and who did they come from? It's a speed round. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, I would say, um, I would say Ken Burns, um, you know, don't make films just because they are um, in, in fashion, you know, Mm. stick to what you believe in. Um, That would be Ken Burns. Um, And well, John Kerry told me to, to hurry up. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe there's something to that. <laughs> I like it. Uh, especially in, with, you know, on, on the backdrop of our conversation about how you <laughs> right, take it right. and methodical. Um, if you had to give filmmakers or provide filmmakers with one piece of advice from your experience, what would it be? I would say, you know, be like a dog with a bone when it comes to, to your work. Um, hold on tight. Don't let anyone tell you that this is not your path. This is not what you should be doing. Hold on to it. Keep going back to it, you know, um, and, and something will come of it. I love that. I love that. Um, you've been doing this a long time and and you were inspired early. We mentioned by hoop dreams, which creatives do you most admire and want to emulate and what do they do from a technical or skill standpoint that makes their work stand apart? You know, we, we've always looked to Errol Morris, um, as a, as a big inspiration. Um, I'm, I'm a big Spike Lee fan. Um, I, you know, I love, um, Joan Mitchell, the artist, the abstract painter. Um, I'm, a huge fan of Jennifer Packer, who's also an abstract painter. Um, you know, I would say it really, really spans the gamut. Um, uh, Alison Bechtel, um, mm, yeah. you know, uh, it's to me, it's not just film. I mean, I'm, I have actually never been the person that wants to sit down and only talk like, about cinema. I mean, I, I love it and I love the ideas, but, um, I like philosophy. I like art. I love books. <laughs> um, you know, this is, there's, there's so many profound voices. Um, and those are just a few. What book are you reading right now? I'm actually reading bell hooks. Um, I'm reading, uh, I think it's called about love. Mm-hmm. Is it? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm reading bell hooks and it's interesting for me because you know, it was written in 2001. I think um, it would be a very different book if, if written today. Um, and, you know, it's also very hetero. It, she focuses a lot on men and women, which is, you know, for me, that's not where my, my love life lies. <laughs> um, but, but she's just so like strong and confident and, you know, no nonsense. And, you know, so I'm, I'm loving her for that. Yeah. That's awesome. And I think when the love story is really good and, and not icky, uh, you'll find those commonalities across all types of love. So I think that's wonderful. And yeah. I will check out about love because I, like you love philosophy and I love reading books as many as I can get my hands on. Um, if you had one month to teach someone how to be a documentary director, Oh, what would be yeah. the first three things you teach them? So you found somebody, they're off the street. They're like, Sarah, I'm, I'm in big trouble. I took an assignment. I lied on my resume. I've got to be competent and I've got 30 days to be competent. What are the first three things you're going to teach them? 
All right. Um, first of all, make a film about what you know. So find, um, find something in your life that you have access to that is interesting. So um, I just actually met a woman who uh, runs this camp and after school program for kids in Newark for jump roping. Mm. She does, you know, she, um, so she uses jump rope as a form of mental health. Um, she's like a winner of all these jump rope competitions. And I'm getting to this because I, you know, I would say like, you know, look at something, someone interesting you've met, look at something that you are involved in that might be interesting and start there. Um, so I guess I would, if, you know, I would say that, um, I would, what would I say next? Um, are they in a documentary film class? Or like, no, no, you are the class. Like, you are the class. Um, <laughs> I'm like, do they have access to equipment? Um, do an interview. So, you know, talk to the person, do an interview, find out their story, and then start thinking about how you can tell their story. Um, is it going to be photographs? Is it going to be, um, you know, a, a video camera? Um, and, you know, I guess for my part, I would say film an interview. Um, you know, I, even if you don't end up doing an interview based documentary, having that interview, Tom and I talk about this all the time, like having that as a resource to like shape the way you want to approach this film is really important. So do an interview. Um, and then think about what you would need to visualize that interview. I mean, it's super simple and this is not the only way to make a film, but if I were going to do a film in a month, um, I would find an interesting subject, interview the subject in some form, <laughs> and think about the ways that you can add visuals to that interview. I mean, it's super simple. <laughs> think about your me- think about the mediums that best suit your subject in the storytelling. That's right. And if we're thinking film, you know, obviously get a film camera. Um, start thinking about ways to represent their story that that's interesting, whether it's, you know, obviously you could film them in their lives, but you could also do these really interesting abstract shots to, to convey, you know, if someone's talking about, you know, Hey, I am a mental health worker, but I have these horrible nightmares every night because I'm so scared that, you know, I'm going to like, um, not be able to help the people I work with. Well, how would you represent those horrible nightmares? What are some interesting cinematic tools to like get into the head of this person? Um, yeah, uh, you know, that's a great a point. Month is a short amount of time. <laughs> but, it's a, it's a great, you know. No, you're right. But it, it, you know, it's a great point. Um, we have an animator, a friend of the podcast, friend of Bonsai named Valerie Barnhart. She lives in uh, Ottawa and you know, she used animation as a medium to tell the story of a, of a child that was raped and murdered. <clears throat> and it at once lessened the blow, moved the story forward, and then also broke your heart. It, it, it was a really smart choice on how to use the, the right medium. Yeah. So for those listening at home, Sarah says, make what you know, do an interview, put it on film, and then pick a medium to tell the story Sarah, this has been an absolute blast. I've had so much fun getting to know you better and listen to your stories and your insights. Do you have any regrets? You've been doing Red Glass now for 15, 16 years. Is there anything you would do different if you had to do it all over again? Uh, nah, I mean, I think like, I, I don't, I don't live in that. I don't live in that zone. Um, I don't even want to like entertain that, that zone. <laughs> um, because we all, we all could really, really wallow in the thousand things we have or haven't done. Um, I feel so fortunate to have the filmmaking partner I have, um, to have been able to, um, you know, spend my life creating um and 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 surviving doing it you know we both have families that we we support um and you know i i just i feel lucky i can't i can't go into regrets it's just it's 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 not who i am <laughs> Beautiful, beautifully put and i think it's a great place for us to ask you where we can find you on social media find you on the internet maybe even see some of your work and please do include where we can see your abstract art too because it's brilliant 
Oh, that's super sweet. Um, yeah, I mean, you can start at redglasspictures.com. You know, we have a bunch of our films there and they will lead you to other places. Um, a number of our things have been on the New York Times. So if you, you know, Google my name, Sarah Klein or Tom Mason and New York Times, you'll get some stuff. Um, and then on, on Instra, we're at Red Glass Picks. And then my art is at S. Klein Studio. And I appreciate you saying that. That's, that's like another whole way that, you know, I express myself and make my life feel, you know, full. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's where we are. It's my pleasure to do it. And we'll end on this. Have you considered making a documentary about your grandparents and the international bead? <laughs> I, I filmed one like 25 years ago and, and I, you know, I, re, I oh, regret. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> okay. I, I'm using the word you, you infiltrated it into my mind, but yeah, I, it's the bead store is, is about folded a, a ways back when my uncle passed away. But, um, so I, I no longer can make that, um, as of now, but yeah, maybe I could put something together. Thanks for planting that seed. It's pretty incredible. I mean, your grandparents, you know, having this business so long ago that I think probably influenced your parents to, or at least your mom to be in jewelry, maybe, perhaps, I don't know, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, I think mostly, most importantly, it was, um, it, it was a, a, this real like old school business, right? These were like Jewish Jewish people who could not get loans back then. Right. So they were able to kind of put together, cobble together this bead store. And it was every side of Chicago. So South side, I mean, it was, it was black, white, um, stars, you know, all sorts of people going to this little magical space. It's something that we don't have anymore because of, of, you know, online shopping, I think, but yeah. it was one of these like vestiges of America that um, I, you know, I really value and lucky that I got to work there when I was young. That's amazing. I heard they used to do a hundred hour weeks. Oh yeah. Come on. Like that's, you know, we all, anyone who grew up like, like my dad, you know, he didn't do after school programs. You know, <laughs> he like worked at the bead store. You don't like, you know, there was no like French lessons. There was no, like, it was, you know, you're going to come and work. Like it was a yeah. you know, different time. Yeah. Dad, cool guy as well. And, um, this has been a blast. Sarah, yeah, I hope you. we, uh, I hope we stay in touch uh, some more. Maybe we can collaborate together. I'm, I'm certainly a fan of you and Tom's work. And if you need anything, uh, you know, I'm just a phone call, email, text away per usual. But um, we have enough probably for a round two sometime in the future as well. I would love to do that. And if I'm in New York, I'm going to look you up. And if you come to Nashville, you get the key to the city. So. All right. Well, I, I love what you're doing and I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to, to ask questions. So thank you. Anytime, Sarah, you're the best. Talk to you soon. Talk to you. Thank you. All right. Be good. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Make It Podcast. To find out more information about this week's topics, including links to relevant blog posts, projects, and indie creatives, please visit our website at www.banzai.film. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast community on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative and the show will pop right up. You now have the opportunity to support the production of this podcast. If you love Make It and are a true fan of what we're trying to accomplish in the indie film community, please visit www.bonsai.film and click Contribute contributions start at only five dollars monthly you can follow us on instagram and twitter at underscore bonsai creative and on facebook by searching for bonsai creative you can provide feedback to us via email at contact at bonsai.film and you can follow me chris on twitter at flaming your heart that's f-l-a-m-e-i-n-u-r-h-e-a-r-t and of course if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on Services to explore a variety of offerings from keynotes and panels to pitch readiness assessments and so much more. You have everything to gain. Until next time, be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.